This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Paul Niehaus is an associate professor in the Department of Economics. He works with governments in emerging economies to improve the implementation of social programs. As co-founder and president of Segovia Technology Company and Give Directly, he's working to help end extreme poverty with electronic payment technology. Tonight, he'll describe how technological innovation and new evidence are driving one of the most profound changes in the history of foreign aid. In 2013, foreign policy named him one of its 100 leading global thinkers. Uh, one of the things I love about UCSD, um, you know, in my mind, there are sort of two big challenges facing us, right? There's climate and global poverty. Um, and one of the things I love about UC San Diego is that we have great people working on both. Um, I have the, uh, the good fortune and the excitement to get up in the morning and think about what we can do to accelerate the end of extreme poverty. And I want to share with you a simple message tonight, which is that the way we fight extreme poverty can and should change in a fundamental way. To be specific, we should spend less money buying things that we think poor people need and give more money directly to poor people to let them do what they want with it. Now to explain this, I want you to come back with me to my grad school days and I want to share with you two observations that my uh, collaborators and I made at the time that have really driven my work ever since. Uh, the first is evidence. I uh, did my PhD in economics at a really exciting time for the profession because for the first 50 years or so of development economics of foreign aid, we didn't test our ideas experimentally. Right. Experimental testing is sort of at the heart of learning in many fields of human endeavor, like clinical trials in medicine, A-B testing in technology. We didn't do that for a very long time with foreign aid. But in the early 2000s, development economists started to get out in the field and do this. And so we were learning at an incredibly rapid clip. And as you'd expect, there were some things that didn't work as well as we'd hoped. I think it's fair to say that microcredit hasn't lived up to the hopes that we had for it. Uh, jobs and skills trainings haven't worked out well. You know, we have this aphorism, right? Teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. Uh, turns out we're really bad at fishing lessons. Right? Uh, but the converse is, of course, there are other things that work better than we'd expected. And it seemed clear to us that across test after test in many different contexts, this really simple approach of giving money to poor people, letting them do what they want with it, uh, was working really well. And it's a hard literature to summarize because it's enormous, but I wanted to give you some sense with this map of the scope in terms of geography and in terms of outcomes um, and pull out three themes that I think are important from the literature. The first is that we haven't seen a lot of the negative things that we worried about. So across 19 studies reviewed by the World Bank, we haven't seen any evidence of people drinking or smoking more, right? which is one of the things that we often worry about, if we're honest. Uh, if anything, we've seen the opposite. Across six studies recently reviewed by folks at MIT, we haven't seen evidence of people working less after receiving cash transfers. Right? So those, those negative things that we were worried about have not materialized. Um, the flip side is we have seen positive impacts. And I'd emphasize that they're incredibly varied. In some contexts, we'll see reductions in HIV rates among teenage girls. In other contexts, we'll see increases in earnings. Um, in other contexts, we'll see reductions in child labor, increases in schooling. Um, in some of the work that we've done in East Africa, we've seen a lot of people upgrading their roofs from a thatch roof to a metal roof. That turns out to be a great investment because if you have a thatch roof, you've got to repair it every year and the metal roof lasts for a really long time. We think it's around a 20% rate of return on that investment. Um, we'd all love to have that on our 401ks, wouldn't we? Right? So you know, there's no one thing that people do when you give them money and that's kind of the point because the point is about flexibility right? and it's about their ability to pursue what they see as a priority. Um, the last thing that I'd pull from this literature, which is really important, is that we have evidence of long-term impacts. And that's so important because we talk a lot about sustainability, right? We care about the long-term in this field. But the truth is, we have evidence on the long-term impact of very, very few things. Uh, we do for cash transfers. We have evidence that four or five years out, 
Um, there have been large sustained impacts on the lives of people that have received them. So this evidence was the first observation. Um, the second was the incredible things happening in last mile payments technologies in the emerging markets. Um, we are increasingly in a world in which we're connected digitally and financially to the extreme poor. Um, and mobile money is, of course, probably the best known example of this. Right? So there are hundreds of millions of poor people in the world now who can now receive electronic money on a feature phone that costs as little as $10. You put those two things together, and it seemed to us like an incredible opportunity and something that could potentially reshape the way we think about the bulk of foreign assistance and anti-poverty spending. Now, initially, we were excited about this, and in fact, just as individual donors. Like, we wanted to be able to give away our own money in this way. And we had a series of really interesting conversations with some of the, uh, the existing NGOs to ask if they would let us do that. Um, I think what we found was that, on the one hand, a lot of organizations in this sector do cash transfer programming. And they perceive it as having been very successful. But at the same time, it was clear that nobody was going to be offering us as individuals the opportunity to do this, to send money directly to the extreme poor. And when you think about it, it makes sense. Because at the end of the day, this is an industry that is built to allocate capital on behalf of poor people. That is its reason for existence. And so for at least some part of that industry, the opportunity to send money directly, it is an existential threat. So we came to the conclusion that if we wanted to do this, we were going to have to do it uh, for ourselves from scratch. And so started Give Directly, an NGO that we opened up to the public in 2011. We've grown it from there. This year will probably be at around 50 million in revenue for the year, uh, 80 people around the country, mostly in East Africa, around the world. Um, and I think just as important as the number is Give Directly has become a laboratory to test the ideas and answer the questions um, that other people either can't or don't want to ask. So for example, we didn't know what happens when you give a large lump sum of money to a poor family and let them run with it. Um, we do now, because we've tested that. We're, we're working with USAID this year. Right? USAID has never tested the cost effectiveness of their existing programming against this. We're working with Craig McIntosh here at UC San Diego this year. We're going we're gonna to answer that question for them. So I think of this as one really exciting frontier for this work. Uh, but there's a second frontier, because many of the world's poor don't yet have access to this kind of digital payments infrastructure. And so there's work to be done to push that out into the countryside and get people plugged in. And I've worked on this with my colleague Karthik Moralidharan here in the economics department at UC San Diego. We've had the opportunity to work on it with the government of India. Um, India, as you may know, is in the midst of arguably the most ambitious policy initiative on the planet, uh, issuing biometric IDs to 1.3 billion people. It's an incredibly ambitious undertaking. And it's so important because India currently spends around 2% of GDP on its core anti-poverty programming. And by their own estimates, lose about half of that every year to fraud and corruption. That's an incredible hole to try to plug. So we've had the opportunity in working with the government. Uh, we worked with the government of Andhra Pradesh, one of India's largest states, to randomize the rollout of this biometric technology as they integrated it into their social protection programming. We worked with AP. We randomized this, as you see in the background, over around 20 million people. We think it's probably one of the largest experiments of this kind ever conducted. We don't know for sure. Um, and it was a really landmark agreement to sign an MOU with the, like this with the government and a bold move on their part to subject a major policy initiative to this kind of experimental testing. Uh, what we found was encouraging. And I'd be honest, we went in with sort of 50-50 beliefs about whether this was a good idea or not. There are lots of ways in which this could go wrong or even backfire. Um, as it turns out, this cut corruption in government programs by around a third. It also substantially improved the payment experience for users. It took them less time to get their money. The payments were more predictable, to the point where when we asked them, about 90% of users said that they preferred the new system to the old. And that number was instrumental in the government's decision to retain it as they started to get pushback from vested interests right, who were seeing their money cut out by this new payments infrastructure. So I think of this as the second frontier, the second thing to push on. Um, and I'd also think of this as a, as a, as a close, in a, as a challenge to all of us tonight. The challenge I'd issue to you is to imagine a world in which, because of technologies like this, um, this kind of payments infrastructure becomes ubiquitous. Imagine a world in which everybody's connected to digital electronic payments, and then ask the tough questions. In a world like that, would we still ship bags of rice around the world to help the poor? 
More generally, would we still build opaque, top-heavy AIDS institutions where some, some large share of the money that we spend on aid never even leaves our own shores? Right? Would we still do that? I feel like at UC San Diego, we're, we're really leading the charge to answer a lot of those questions through the work we're doing. Um, but I'll share my own personal perspective. Cash transfers are certainly no panacea. Right? Roads are not going to build themselves. Vaccines are not going to discover themselves uh, simply because poor people have more money in their pockets. But they should be a larger share of what we do. And they should also be the benchmark for everything that we do. With every dollar that we spend, we should ask ourselves the question, are we confident? Do we have good evidence to suggest that we can do more good with this dollar than poor people could do for themselves if they had it? Because in many cases, if we're honest with ourselves, the answer is going to be no. Thanks.